there are a range of types of brain damage that can occur as a result of long-term heavy use of alcohol. G'day and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today we are talking with Dr Sally Hunt from the University of Newcastle about alcohol's effect on mental health. Dr Hunt is a clinical psychologist and senior lecturer. She has been working in the mental health field for almost 20 years and has a focus on the surrounding psychological and mental health impacts of alcohol. In this episode, Dr Hunt talks about the culture towards alcohol, how it affects the brain both temporarily and in some cases permanently, and how it changes our mood and behaviour. Hello Sally and welcome to Wellbeing. Hi, thanks for having me. The majority of Australians drink alcohol, but what is it? What's alcohol? Well, it's um, obviously most people would know that it's a drink, that it's, it's refreshing and something that people like to consume, but at a more basic biological level, um, it's a chemical. And it's a chemical that can affect the way we think and the way we feel, um, both in the short term, but it can also affect us in the long term. Psychologically, why, why do we like alcohol so much? <laughs> well, so alcohol is a relaxant. It certainly um, helps some people to feel a greater sense of calm and relaxation, particularly when they've been experiencing higher levels of stress. Um, and other people talk about a feeling of disinhibition, so feeling like they're freer and more able to uh, put themselves out there a little bit socially in a way that maybe they don't feel so confident to be when they haven't had alcohol. What parts of the brain does it affect? Well, it kind of affects all of the brain. Um, when you're intoxicated with alcohol, your brain is swimming in it. Um, so it, it, it affects things like our balance. It can affect the way that our body moves from and for the motor senses of the brain. But as most people who have had more than two or three glasses of, of any type of alcohol would, would be able to relate to, it does this thing where it puts the part of your brain that does the, well, I think of it as the break, the frontal lobe, it puts that part of your brain kind of sleep for a little while. So you have great ideas about things you should do and the part of your brain that normally says, hey mate, maybe you should have a think about that. Is this really a good idea? Are there any risks that could come from doing that? That part of the brain is um, it's taken a snooze when you've had more than two or three glasses of alcohol and, and that's why we see the sorts of behaviours that we see in people when they've had a bit of alcohol. Does it take effect right away? As soon as you drink alcohol, does it does the, is the brain directly affected straight away? Pretty quickly. It really depends um, from person to person. And the way that alcohol affects our bodies varies greatly on a number of, of factors. So the size of the person, their gender. We know that alcohol affects women more quickly than it affects men. And that's because of the concentration of water in a female body compared to a male body. Um, and obviously a bigger body is going to take longer for the concentration of alcohol to hit the same amount as a smaller body. Um, that said, people start to experience the effects of alcohol really quickly. Um, and, and so it will be something that is detectable in the bloodstream and is affecting behaviour pretty quickly. We mentioned that it can affect the, the genders differently. Can mm. it psychologically affect them differently or is it pretty much the same across the board? Look, I think psychologically it affects people regardless of gender differently. So we, are, we all have such varied responses to our life experiences. Um, one way of grouping people, of course, is by gender and you can make generalisations about um, the way that men or women behave when they've been drinking. So it's a, it's a tricky question to answer because everybody is so different to start with. But um, we definitely see some very clear physiological differences between men and women when they've been drinking. So we know, for example, that if you had a brother and a sister who shared many of the same genetic characteristics and they consume the same amount of alcohol over their lifetime, we know that the sister is more likely to start to experience the health, ill health effect from that alcohol at an earlier age than her brother will. And that's for a whole range of biological differences between men and women. We also know that there are clear differences in the way that men and women drink. So traditionally, men have consumed alcohol at much greater rates than women. Uh, and, and when we're talking about alcohol consumption, we're often talking about quantity of alcohol consumed and frequency for how often we drink. And typically men have, have doubled uh, what women drink both in terms of quantity and frequency. But that's 
changing over recent years and we're starting to see um, some subgroups of, of male drinkers reducing their use and we're starting to see some subgroups of female drinkers increasing their use. We also know that through talking to people about situations in which they drink, that men talk about drinking for reasons like boredom and, and indeed stress relief, but mostly boredom and, and wanting to have a good time. Uh, whilst adult female drinkers tell us that they're drinking to manage stress and they're drinking to cope with um, lots of the social roles and responsibilities that they're carrying. So it sounds like to understand the psychological factors, we need to also understand the biological factors. Yeah. Yeah, look, I come from um, a background in clinical psychology where we use a biopsychosocial model. And so as the name suggests, we look at the combination between biological factors, psychological factors and social factors. And if we pull one of those out to the exclusion of the others, we can miss the bigger picture and be less effective than when we consider the way that all three of those factors um, come together to affect somebody's behaviour. So we've talked about that the effects of alcohol happen pretty quickly. If yep. someone abuses alcohol, can it alter the brain permanently? Um, well, yes, indeed it can. Um, there are a range of, I guess we call them types of brain damage that can occur as a result of long-term heavy use of alcohol. I, we should probably come back to talking about what heavy use, what we mean by heavy use, but um, traditionally we've seen disorders like Corsakoff dementia um, and a range of other dementias and, and memory impairments that are affected by long-term use of alcohol. Um, so there are lots of ways in which alcohol can affect the body and of course the brain is one of the most uh, vital parts of our body so we need to protect it and be mindful I think of the impact that the quantity of alcohol we're consuming can have. So coming back to that question about how much is a lot of alcohol, um, we have a, a governing body here in Australia called the National Health and Medical Research Council or NHMRC and they spend a lot of energy pulling together information from studies not just of physical harm but also looking at social harm and, and broader issues arising from the use of alcohol and they use that information to determine a level at which they, they believe um, people should try to drink below to minimise the risk of harm arising from the use of alcohol. So you'll notice firstly that I'm not saying safe amount of alcohol because um, physically there isn't a safe amount of alcohol. It is a toxin. Um, it's in the same class of toxins as nicotine. So it is a carcinogen. Uh, so that's the sad, the sad news that I have to give your listeners today. But the other thing that we need to know is that there is a limit or an amount. If we can stay below that amount, then we're, we're probably doing a, a better job of protecting our bodies and our health into the future. So NHMRC talk about uh, a limit in terms of the amount of alcohol we consume on any given day. And they suggest that trying to keep your daily consumption to two standard drinks or, or fewer is a good idea. And that in terms of your um, drinking on a heavy occasion, so your uh, occasional heavier use to kept below four standard drinks. So for some of your listeners, that might not sound like a lot. And a standard drink is about 100 of mils of wine so it's not a lot or one nip of spirit and so I always encourage people when, I, when we talk about this to take the glass that you would typically put your wine in or your beer in or your spirits in pour the amount you would typically pour and then get out a measuring jug and measure it to see whether your standard drink is in fact standard because I think it's really important that people have the right information so that they can make informed choices for themselves and what they put into their body. Is there a connection between mental health issues and, and alcohol in any way? Yeah, there is, yes. So we talk about comorbidity or the co-occurrence of um, mental health problems and, and substance use problems, including alcohol use. And we know that particularly problems like depression and anxiety are significantly more likely to happen if somebody is also drinking alcohol at hazardous levels than they are for the general population. And the reverse is true. So also having depression or anxiety is associated with a higher risk of having harmful alcohol use. So there's a very, there's a very close relationship between mental health problems and alcohol use. What are some biological or psychological reasons for that? So there's, I, can, I, I wrote a PhD on this one, so I can bore you listeners with this topic. But um, 
when we talk about comorbidity, there is a couple of different reasons that it can happen. So it can be that problem A causes problem B. So we could look at the ways in which drinking causes uh, a depression. It could be that problem B causes problem A. So depression causes drinking. And there's definitely evidence for both of those um, interactions occurring. And sometimes we can identify a third path, which is that there's something in common that's causing both of those problems. Um, from a clinical standpoint, from a treatment standpoint, what really matters to me is not so much which causes which, but rather once that pattern of comorbidity, so having both the alcohol use problem and the depression or the anxiety, for example, once that pattern is happening, we know that having both of those things results in a, a worse outcome for the person. It's harder for them to manage. It's less likely that they're going to get the treatment that they need. And when they do get the treatment that they need, they're going to be in treatment for longer. So um, I like to think about trying to prevent that from occurring in the first place through providing education to people, offering early intervention and really simple um, health messages about alcohol use. You're listening to Wellbeing a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Dr. Sally Hunt from the University of Newcastle, where we are discussing alcohol's effect on mental health. If people get to that point where the brain is altered, can that affect their psychological state and emotional state for, for the rest of their life? Well, I, I guess it depends on the type of alteration that you're talking about. So we those um, more serious dementia heart presentations and this is getting outside my area of expertise as a psychologist but with those dementias it's typically felt that once the harm has been done to the brain it's very difficult for that person to, re to for that harm to be repaired but if we're talking more about things like impulsivity and feeling really emotional and distressed the way that people could probably um, identify with when they've had a, you know more to drink than they normally would those sorts of um, psychological distress can definitely be helped with, with treatments, with psychological treatment. Um, and we know that cognitive behaviour therapy is very effective for helping people with both their alcohol use and the mental health problems that they're presenting with. So I'd really encourage anybody who's worried about that to have a chat with your GP probably as a first port of call and ask if you can be referred to a psychologist who specialises in, uh, in helping people with, with addictive behaviours. So would you say that... When it comes to, in the recovery sense, if someone wants to recover from it, what, what's important isn't just getting off the alcohol, at, but the psychological area there too. Yeah. Yeah, look, I actually try not to think about people having, say, a problem with alcohol, and rather I find it much more useful to think that they're having a problem coping, they're having a problem managing certain situations. And that alcohol has become a tool that they're using to manage that. Um, you know, I'm sure that some of your listeners have, have experienced being at a party or, you know, in a situation where they feel a bit awkward or feeling really down and lonely and thinking, oh, I'll have a drink that'll make me feel better or, or that'll take this awful feeling of anxiety away. If we just treat the drinking by, say, taking the, the alcohol away from them, that feeling of loneliness or anxiety is still there. And so... We need to work on both together. So we need to help people manage their anxiety or their depression or loneliness or stress in a more healthy and adaptive way. Because, I mean, as we all know, certainly over the past few years, this has been really well demonstrated. We're going to experience stress. There are going to be upsetting things that happen in our lives. That's, that's part of a normal life course. And in order to navigate that, we need to have some tools, some coping tools that we can use. And, and where people can really come unstuck is if alcohol becomes their main tool that they're using and they don't have other tools to use. How can alcohol affect the psychological state of adolescents if they start drinking earlier than maybe what they should be? Yeah, well, look, adolescent brains are doing a whole lot of really important growing. It's a time where our brains are being refined. Uh, we're born with far more neural connections than we need. And, you know, that saying, use it or lose it, if we don't, um, sorry, during adolescence, that's when our brain is working out which connections it doesn't need anymore and which ones to lose. So it's working really hard. Um, and so the adolescent developing brain is really special and we need to protect it. And if we add alcohol into the mix, it makes it even harder for that brain to do the important work that it needs to be doing. The other thing we know about adolescence is it's a time when that frontal lobe that I mentioned earlier, the, the break of the brain, the part of your brain that says, wait a second, is this a good idea? During adolescence, 
that part of the brain is already under pressure um, and is rebooting, if you want to use a computer analogy. And so adding another substance that also impacts that part of the brain places a really um, unreasonable amount of pressure. And so that's when we see adolescents getting into some pretty messy situations when they've been drinking because they don't have um, the reserve in terms of their good judgment to be able to stay safe and, and make good choices. What can happen in in later life for adolescents that may drink alcohol early on? Is there any anything that can happen to them, like m- mentally? Um, oh, well, I mean, I think it, that's a tricky question to answer, but we know that drinking earlier, so the earlier somebody is drinking and certainly the earlier they're drinking at hazardous levels, uh, that's associated with heavier and more hazardous drinking later in life. So there is definitely a connection there between drinking as an adolescent and drinking later in life. Um, and the risk is if, if a young person starts drinking as a coping tool or drinking as a socialising tool, when they're young, but they're missing out on those critical periods for developing those other tools that they can use for coping, those other tools that they can use for dealing with upsetting things that might happen. So we actually want our adolescents to be learning a whole lot of different strategies for managing life's ups and downs rather than turning straight to alcohol. Um, in terms of setting them up, in terms of um, depression or anxiety or other mental health concerns, it really is very individual. Um, but I think as a rule of thumb, we'd be encouraging that people under 18 don't drink alcohol at all. Um, and certainly that parents don't provide that alcohol to their youngsters. From a psychological standpoint, can anyone develop a problem with alcohol? Yeah, I think so. I don't think anybody is immune. Um, I, I, look, with any alcohol or substance or mental health problem, an analogy that I find really helpful is to imagine that your brain or your your being is like a big room and there's a light in that room and that light is the alcohol problem or the depression or the anxiety and there's a switch and for some people the switch is teeny tiny so small that it would be really hard to flip that switch and those are people who, who through you know just good good genes and good luck are really robust and unlikely to, to develop these problems for other people People, the switch is huge and it's really easy for it to get flipped on. So it only takes a small bit of stress or a you know a few, a few occasions of use and they're finding that that problem, whether it's with alcohol or with their mood or their anxiety, that problem becomes overwhelming for them very easily and very early. And for most of us in the middle, the switch is normal size and it just takes a certain amount of people coming in the room to turn that light on. So I guess what I'm trying to describe is a, a fan of people from those who are probably quite unlikely to develop these problems just because that's how they, you know, the luck of the genetic lottery that they've won. Other people at one extreme who it doesn't take very much of them to develop those problems and the majority in the middle, somewhere in the middle where certainly is something that could happen um, and it's about having the right combination of biological, psychological and social experiences to bring that about. With using your your analogy of the switch, is it does that switch become easier to to flick on for a for a problem with alcohol if there is already a pre existing mental health issue kind of going on? Yeah, yeah, I would think that those comorbid or pre existing problems are additional stresses in the room, so they're extra extra hands that are looking for that switch for sure. Um, and look, and, and this is you know what some of us spend our entire careers working on to really try and understand how that works and how, more importantly, how we can protect people so that if we know they have those vulnerabilities, we can provide them the support that they need um, to live with, with those vulnerabilities. So there's no simple answer about that. But I think if people are aware that they have got those other comorbidities, then it's really worthwhile having a team of people who can support you to learn some other strategies. So talking to your doctor, talking to a psychologist or a social worker or a, a mental health nurse, Having people who are in your corner, trusted family members, um, or others that you feel that you can, get, you know, catch catch up with every now and then, check in with about how you're going, so that if things are that switch is starting to flick, you've got some trusted people that you can turn to for early help. We've spoken a bit about men- the mental health of the person that does ha- that may have a the problem with the alcohol, but how does the how is the mental health of the people around them affected? Yeah, it is affected. And uh, a lot of our research lately has been looking at how we can support carers. And that's because 
we know that carers this large unpaid workforce that if we took the carers out of the picture and by carers I don't just mean um, mums and dads I mean I guess anybody who cares for that person whether it's a spouse or a child or a friend um, that we need to support our carers so that they can keep being there to support the person with the problem. Um, we did some interviews uh, a few years ago now with people who were caring for people who use other substances and one of the mums said something that resonates really strongly and she talked about when somebody else in the family has got a problem with drugs or alcohol, how the rest of the family has to live with that substance use problem too, even if they're not the ones who are using. And, and so... A lot of our work is about helping people to live with it, not in it. So helping them to recognise that they need to do what fits with their values and their judgment around um, providing support for the loved one, but also not putting off their own life goals. Sometimes family members can say, well, when so-and-so stops having this problem, oh, that's when I'll have my holiday, but I couldn't have a holiday while they're still dealing with the problem they're dealing with. Or, um, you know, we'll move house when this is resolved. And what we've learned from carers that we've talked to is that the, those who are thriving are able to say, if I want to move house, if I want to go on a holiday, I'm going to find a way to do that. Because if I wait until until this is all resolved, I may never get there. So recognising that they can't change their loved one's behaviour and they need to keep themselves healthy so they can continue to be a support. You're listening to Wellbeing. A nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Dr. Sally Hunt from the University of Newcastle, where we are discussing alcohol's effect on mental health. And I would imagine too that there'd be quite a lot of psychological challenges for the person that has the has the problem with the alcohol in getting to that point where they want to take on recovery. What are some of those mm. challenges, psychological challenges, to getting to that point? Look, I think the idea of recovery is an interesting one and it's something that varies greatly around the globe. So if you're familiar with um, typically American presentations of substance use and recovery, they talk about this idea of alcohol use being uh, like the disease. You've probably heard people presenting to Alcoholics Anonymous and talking about, you know, I'm an alcoholic and that idea that they will always be an alcoholic. In Australia, we don't tend to take that approach so mm. much and we take what's called a harm minimization approach. Um, and I, I have more of a behavioral approach rather than a disease model. So I look at the behavior and say, well, this person is engaging in this behavior. Um, and one of the benefits of that approach, I think, for the person is that it doesn't label them as you are an alcoholic, you have this mm. problem. Um, because it's hard for us to imagine changing something that's a central part of ourselves. So it's very hard to think, well, I can't stop being an, al an alcoholic if you've told me I'm an alcoholic. Um, whereas if we identify when you're very stressed, you're using alcohol as a coping strategy. That's a behaviour that people can imagine changing. So people can think about, well, I can try to experience less stress or I can try to manage my stress with a different strategy than using alcohol to manage it. So we don't talk about it being a, a black and white, alcoholic or not alcoholic, mm -hmm. disease or not disease model. We say, what can you do to reduce this behaviour? So I think that overcomes one of the hurdles for people, which is this idea, if they like drinking, that they may never be able to do that again. Now, indeed, some drinkers say, look, it just doesn't fit for me. When I drink, I, I don't seem to have an off switch and I really struggle and, and it's easier for me to go completely um, cold turkey than it is for me to try and cut back and just drink in a moderate way. But many people are able to identify that their drinking has become problematic mm. and they're able to reduce their drinking without giving it up entirely. And I think having that piece of knowledge um, is something that people find really encouraging when they're thinking about starting to make a change. Um, and so along those lines, we talk to people about taking a holiday from alcohol. And so I think things like dry July and fed fast um, they all lend themselves to that really nicely. That idea that I, I'm just going to do it for a month and I'm going to notice what's different about my life when alcohol's not in the picture compared to when I'm drinking every day, for example. In wider society, would you say that with that stigma that some may have towards people that they see that have problems with alcohol, are we getting better in how in that stigma? Are we are we improving? Are we getting less stigma towards mm. people? Yeah, look, I actually 
actually worry in Australia sometimes, not that we want more stigma, but that alcohol is, is one of the substances that we, we have really permissive attitudes towards. So we actually find that people live in the community with a, a fairly significant alcohol use disorder for a long time, you know, for, for upwards of, of seven or eight years before it comes to the attention of, of medical people. So we... We're really aware now, we're very fluent in our awareness of mental health difficulties, which I think is, is great, but it'd be lovely for us to start to have a better understanding of how alcohol can be harmful and to, to um, reduce that cultural sort of reliance mm. on alcohol mm. as being a key part of, you know, those major social events. We've got a long weekend coming up, you know, and I wonder how many people would book out drinking into one of the days or, or more than mm. one of the days mm. of the long weekend just because that's what you do um, in a long weekend. So, yeah, it, 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 um, I think in Australia we've got a particular relationship with alcohol that we definitely need to talk more about. So how should we go about alcohol then in society? What's the, is it balance? Is it like, what do you think? It, it's definitely, um, it's something that we can't tell people how to drink or what to drink. I think the more we, we impose rules on people and tell them that they're doing something right or wrong, or good or bad, um, the harder it is for people to accept that and to change. I prefer to encourage people to think about their drinking and the role that alcohol is playing in their lives and whether or not they like it. You know, undoubtedly there are going to be good things about their drinking. There are going to be things that they enjoy about it. Um, and it's up to each individual to reflect on how that fits in the big picture. So there are things that you do like about it. Are there things that you don't like about it as well? Are there, are there areas in which drinking makes life harder? Um, I know, I, I can recall as a, as a younger person myself, hating hangovers and thinking, oh, hangovers are about the most unpleasant thing I think I've, my body can do. I want to avoid those at all costs. And so hating those so much made it easier for me to think, well, I don't need to drink to the level that I'm going to experience a hangover because I find on that, if I'm picturing a big set of scales in my head, the hangover outweighs the enjoyment of drinking. Um, for other people, there'd be different motivators and different things that they need to weigh up. But I think something that's important is that people really do get the right information so that they can weigh up their own set of scales for themselves with accurate information about what alcohol does do to their body. Um, and that we create, and I think this is happening over recent years, create an environment where not drinking is just as acceptable as drinking in social situations. So, you know, we now have a variety of alcohol-free um, they're actually called alcohol-free spirits or alcohol-free beers and alcohol-free wine mm. so that people can still participate in social situations without feeling excluded. Um, and just making that a normal part of, of socialising. The other thing that comes up when I talk to people about this topic is so many people telling me, oh, well, I don't drink and I'm made to feel like a bit of an outcast if I'm in a social situation and I don't want to drink or people assume I'm pregnant or, or people assume I've got mm. a real problem. Um, and and almost always that's not the case, that that person has just chosen for a variety of reasons that they don't really want to drink that night or they don't want to drink much at all or at all. Um, so it would be nice as a, as a society and as a community if we can start to embrace not drinking as easily as we embrace people drinking in social situations. Well, thank you for taking the time to be on the show today, Sally. Oh, it's been my pleasure. My guest today was Dr. Sally Hunt from the University of Newcastle. Tune in next week where we discuss fitness and movement with a researcher and accomplished sports person. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins, and all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.